Welcome everyone on behalf of Dallas College and the sustainability team. My name is Faye Davis and I will be your host today. We're also very grateful for the WebEx support team joining us here as well. So let's get started. Today's session is about local agriculture and the Dallas farmers market. I'd like you to I'd like to introduce our speaker, Savannah Nordstrom. Savannah is the farm and enrichment coordinator of Dallas Far Farmers Market, who specializes in environmental and agriculture communication. Savannah is a graduate of Georgia State University, and she is the connection to the farmers and ran ranchers serving North Texas. Um, from field trips to farm visits, Savannah provides agriculture, agricultural enrichment to groups of all ages. Thank you so much, Savannah, for joining us today. Please go ahead and get started whenever you want. All right, well, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really exciting to talk to a group of college students who are just now starting to explore career options and ways to get involved with sustainability because I was in that place not so long ago. And um, now I found myself here at the Dallas Farmers Market. Um, the Dallas Farmers Market has been a part of agriculture in Texas, North Texas. Um, since the early 1900s, uh, before there was even sheds here, um, there were farmers coming from all over Texas to bring their goods here, and it, that is still the case. They are still coming from all over Texas. Um, our farmers come from Texas or 400 miles of Dallas and bring their agricultural products here every Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I'm excited to share with you why agricultural sustainability is important and really how those two concepts even go together, because it's not always obvious. Um, so first of all, though, I want to kind of talk about um, how I got to this point, because I think a lot of you will connect with this kind of journey. So um, about me right now. So yes, I'm Savannah Nordstrom, and I'm the Farm and Enrichment Coordinator here, and I appreciate the introduction. I've had the opportunity to work with all types of age groups when they come to visit the farmer's market, um, whether I'm doing a field trip or have some sort of activity for children. Um, I'm working with also corporate groups who come by and are just hoping to learn a little bit about this um, concept that's becoming more familiar, this concept of farm to table, shortening the food chain, knowing your farmer. It's becoming a really um, common concept that people are excited to learn about. So I'm, um, kind of the liaison to talk about how you can get involved with local agriculture and also tell the stories of the farmers and ranchers here. But I didn't see myself um, working in agriculture when I first started in college. That was kind of the farthest thing from my mind. I cared a lot about sustainability and um, learning what it meant to be a good steward of this planet. So I started my journey as an environmental science major at Georgia State University, which if you don't know, is located in uh, downtown Atlanta. So it's very urban um, and we have a lot of obvious ways that we impact the environment when we're living downtown, just like when we're in Dallas, you can look around and you see the impact that we have. But the thing that came to the forefront of my mind wasn't farming. Um, to me, it seemed like farming was something we needed to like overcome because it was clearly having negative impacts. Um, and so I was interested in organic food, um, but it wasn't until I started realizing that it's every meal that we're eating that we're making a choice about how the environment is gonna be stewarded based off of our choices. Um, so after college, I started working more um, with students because I was still more in the realm of sustainability uh, I was working at um, the Arboretum with children and families and talking about sustainability concepts broadly, just kind of understanding what is our environment? Um, what impact do we have on our environment? And how does it affect us when our environment isn't being managed sustainably? Um, and so a lot of what it led me to was looking for action-oriented communication. When we hear these things that might be concerning to us, um, when we know that the choices that we make do make an impact on the environment, what do we do with that information? Because it can feel a little bit 
overwhelming. Um, you might feel like there's nothing that you can do, but we know because based on the results that we see, when we see grocery stores trying to adopt organic uh, food options or trying to make it more affordable for all people, we know that our voice has been heard. So how do we make those action-oriented choices? Well, every meal, that's something that comes up. And so I realized that agriculture was a pivotal point of sustainability and one that I felt I could really communicate with other people well. And so that's come up in every point in my life. It's something that I enjoy because not only am I working at a farmer's market, but I'm also learning to keep bees, um, keeping chickens. And then, yeah, I put pie enthusiasts because what better way to enjoy fresh fruit than to put it in a delicious pie. It's also a challenge and it's a beautiful thing to share with friends and enjoy um, the fruits of a hard harvest. So um, first of all, I think it's important that we define our terms because we're going to talk about sustainability and agriculture. How do they really come together? Because a lot of it can be vague. So let's talk about what what is agriculture? Um, if you're listening and have some thoughts on a product that you've used, I'd be happy to see you pop in the chat with an item that is an agricultural item that you've used today. Um, anything that you might have, but I'll name a couple for myself. Well, you know, if you have breakfast this morning, then everything that you consumed was likely an agricultural product. Of course, there are some alternatives now that may be um, more synthetic, but by and large, everything you consumed was an agricultural um, product. Oh, yep, I'm seeing coffee, edamame, yes, delicious. These are awesome. And those are food products, but then it goes beyond that. It goes beyond what we think of on the surface level. My clothing today, you know, cotton, that is an agricultural product. Um, and then there's the list that of things that we don't think of right off the bat, you know, um, the paper, because wood, growing wood, um, forestry is a type of agriculture, because what is agriculture really? It's a science, it's an art, it's a practice. And we might hear, Agriculture is an art. That's interesting. But I think that's kind of why it speaks to so many of us because we're expressing um, our view of our relationship with the environment because we're choosing how we'll grow things, what will grow, what will it look like, how will we tend it. So, yeah, agriculture is an art. Um, and it's any type of stewardship of the soil, producing crops, raising livestock. Um, all of these things are going to, <laughs> sorry, I was distracted because I saw that you guys were enjoying the presentation. I appreciate that a lot because it, it's important to me. Uh, every, every choice that we make is going to um, impact how we're going to steward the land. So if we're clear about what agriculture is, it's any type of interaction that we have with the environment. And that be means though, that by nature, we are impacting the environment when we participate in agriculture. So what are those impacts? When, we're inter when we are interacting with the environment through agriculture, there are various ways we're gonna impact it, but some of the primary ways is that, well, you're taking up space. If you're going to do agriculture, you're taking space and choosing to use that land to grow food. Um, and that land will then not be available for other purposes, such as living on it, uh, you know, traditionally, or grow, putting um, parking lot, you know, or the rainforest, that's a big one. You know, if you have farmland, you can't also therefore have rainforest, or you can't therefore also have wild spaces. So by nature, when we do agriculture, we have to face the, you know, dilemma of we are gonna have farmland here, and we can't have something else, or maybe we have to get creative. There's also that we're going to have to put nutrient inputs, or we're going to have some sort of way of managing our soil. Because I want to be clear here that when I say that these are impacts, they don't necessarily have to be negative. I think a lot of us can come to the, um, the memory very quickly of times when we've seen this mismanaged um, or stories that we've heard, but we have to understand that farming is going to going to interact in these ways, regardless of if it's positive or negative. These are the facts of how agriculture 
will work. You're going to have to put um, some sort of nutrient balance in the mix to be able to grow tomatoes in an area that previously was home to a wooded forest. There's, you're going to have to have some sort of manipulation of the, um, the nutrients. And that can also impact our water quality because how you get those nutrients there and whether or not they stay in place, that's going to be part of how you do your art of agriculture. Um, that's going to affect the soil quality. Is it going to be depleted or is it going to be sustained? Is it going to change the landscape? Um, and then biodiversity. So biodiversity is another kind of big word, but it's just the different types of life forms that you find in one area. So if you have a forest and then it becomes a agricultural land, the biodiversity is lessened because you don't have as many different types of trees, as many different types of animals. Now, instead, you've got perhaps only, you know, five types of crops that are growing and then the animals uh, that might be able to live in that environment. And then also um, the air quality, because there are um, CO2 emissions from uh, vehicles used to maintain the ground. Um, but also air quality, because when we're tilling, there can be um, stuff put up into the air or when we're spraying. If we're spraying, if that's part of your agricultural practice, whatever you spray can be particulate matter in the air. These are all different ways that we can interact with our environment impact the environment in all different ways that we have to consider what we're going to do when we do agriculture. So I wanted to just kind of take it up to a satellite view. Um, this is very close by. This is just north of Dallas. This is the Red River, um, the border between Texas and Arkansas uh, and Oklahoma. Sorry, I'm from Georgia. That'll come up. But uh, yes, the border between Texas and Oklahoma. And you can see very clearly that there are different representations of just what we've talked about. So let me get my little tool here to kind of circle some things for you. So there are some clear representations here of farmland. This, this is agricultural land. You can see because it's um, piece and parceled, it's in square shapes. Um, these are areas that are not gonna be very biodiverse because there's really only maybe one crop grown there. It may just be grown for hay or it may have cattle on them. So that biodiversity, it's just, just one primarily. Um, so we're also taking up space. We can see that a lot of this space is for agricultural purposes, which can be a good thing. We can use agricultural space responsibly. It's gonna be used for something and we are certainly here. So this is something that is necessary. Um, so it's not to say it's a bad thing that we're taking up space, but it's just clear in this image that is taking up a lot. Um, nutrient inputs. You can see that there are some areas that perhaps had to have some sort of nutrient inputs to be um, more fertile than the other areas around them. It's also likely that they were using irrigation, and that's why you get these funny uh, circles going on that are different from the rest of the landscape. And then let's see if I can clear here. Okay, and so the next point that we talked about was um, the so soil quality in the landscape. You can see here that there is erosion going on along the banks of the river. Now this is a natural thing, but what increases the amount of erosion that you see is the lack of um, soil that is held in place by biodiversity. So you can see this interesting dynamic to look at that this over here is farmland. All of this over here is just farmland. And this is the national grasslands. And so you, this is a very biodiverse area. You can see the green, um, the density of the soil. It's holding everything in place. Um, and you can see that it kind of results in less erosion happening in this area, you can just kind of see there's not as much um, sand banked up on the sides of the river. And so that's just kind of like a overview, like of the broader picture outside of the farm, each individual farm making a collective impact on our local environment. Um, and so now I have kind of an interesting example for you guys. Let's see here. I had to get out of annotation mode. Okay. Go. 
Do any of you guys have a guess at where this is at? It looks like a very arid landscape. I mean, you can see trees. Um, if, if I were to guess, I asked a friend to guess on this, and she said that she thought maybe it was somewhere in West Texas. But this is actually, yeah, okay, so someone else in the chat thinks perhaps West Texas. This is shockingly South Georgia. So I'm from Georgia, and this is Providence Canyon. Um, this is the result of not millions of years, like the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. This is the result of a few decades of poor agricultural management in the 1800s. This was previously piney woods is what they kind of call this, because you can see all of the pine trees in the background. This should not be a canyon. But it is, and now it's actually a state park too, but <laughs> it's a marvel of what we can do when we're not paying attention to our agricultural management, because all of this should be flat primarily. And instead it was swept away because we were tilling the land and not putting any sort of um, top, the, the cover crops that can hold soil in place um, and instead, you get strong uh, winds and water, and this erodes away very quickly. So several decades, and you create a canyon in South Georgia. Um, it's pretty wild what we can do when we're not paying attention. So we come to the question um, that is on a lot of our minds pretty frequently, which is, how do we reduce our impact? It comes up a lot. Um, that's one of the very first concepts that I think I started to explore when I realized the impact that we have on the environment. How do I reduce my impact? But what I have come to realize in working with agriculture is that by being here, we will make an impact. And so we have a choice. Um, will we make a positive impact because our impact will be there. So will it be a positive? And when it can't necessarily be positive, like I was talking about with the use of space, maybe maybe it has to take away in some way, can we lessen what we're doing? So how do we mitigate our impact? How do we make choices that are responsible and um, consider all the ways that we're interacting with our environment? So I think a way of Thinking about this is if you think about um, the concept of a carbon footprint, um, we're, when we're making our carbon footprint, we are stepping on these fossil fuel ideas, we're making an impact, um, but instead of the concept that we're just not going to make an impact, let's think about switching to something that is a firmer foundation. We are not going to make such a strong uh, indention, it's not going to take so much, if it can hold our weight. And when we move to these concepts that are sustainable or regenerative, it can hold our weight. So let's think about mitigating or making a positive impact. And here are some ways um, that we can do that. First of all, let's understand what sustainability is. Um, that was a game changer for me because sustainability is used a lot. And when we use these terms, um, Again and again, the reason why I like to define them is because sometimes they lose the gravity of what it really means, because sustainability can become synonymous with the idea of it's green. It's green. What does that mean? What does it mean to be green? Um, it's eco friendly. OK, well, you know, these are nice concepts, but let's talk about what do we mean when we say we want to be sustainable? Well, it means we want to continue to be able to do something. Forever. It's sustained. It is not going to be depleted no matter how long we do it because it's sustainable. We are gonna be able to keep going without interruption and without depletion. That is a very hard thing to do um, if we're not careful and we're not paying attention because we can see um, with things like the Providence Canyon that I was showing you, that is not sustainable. That is now depleted and that is unlikely to be farmland in my lifetime. I mean, it happened fast. Maybe we could figure out a way to make it uh, reverse it. But when we don't do things sustainably with the idea in mind that we're, what we mean is forever, that can be a problem. So 
Um, divine, defining that is great. And there's also now the con uh, a couple of concepts that I do want to mention here, which is um, regenerative agriculture. So regenerative moves beyond uh, sustainability because it's not just that we're going to be able to keep something the same at the level that it is. Regenerative actually means that we're going to improve the condition of it. So there are some ways that we can do that, and I'll show you guys a couple of examples, but we're not just going to keep it how it is. We're going to improve it because we know, we're recognizing that we've already made a negative impact that needs to be improved upon. Um, so part of sustainability and why, like why is that important when we're talking about our community? Because a lot of us are, are really driven towards um, you know, justice. That can be something that really makes you motivated to make a difference because you want to see everybody um, be able to have access to a healthy community and a healthy lifestyle. So what, how does that play into sustainability? Well, sustainability can help us create a resilient food system where everybody has access to fresh food because you have more ways of gaining access to it. So when we say resilient, we want to be able to withstand changes and we want to be able to recover quickly from difficult conditions. So this has a lot of um, ways of impacting our community and um, our ideas of how we connect with one another. Um, so it can be kind of complicated because now we're going to take this concept of sustainability in agriculture and just draw it really local for a minute and think about where we get our food. Because if like the model on the left, if where we get our food is always at the supermarket, what happens if there's not food at the supermarket, which many of us did experience, unfortunately, um, in the last year or two, we've experienced what it was like to go to the store and not necessarily be sure that the food would be available. So if that's your only avenue to access food, then that is not resilient because we can't switch we can't change to a different plan if there is no other plan and so what makes the food system on the right more sustainable it's all these different avenues and yes this is a cute drawing that is talking about a very serious topic um, but i really love the illustration because we need to make this something that is exciting it's not scary it's exciting it's exciting that i can grow food and i can share it and i can um, bring it to a farmer's market. That's where that comes in. Um, so we're, we're just adding additional avenues uh, that also support a sustainable food system and a healthy community because suddenly there's more healthy options available for more people no matter what's going on on a grander scale because the food system on the left is relying a lot on um, synthetic commodities like our fertilizers, um, all the seeds being bought every year, um, taking them to industrial agriculture, which we've talked about taking up space. They also um, tend to be unsustainable, not like monocultures where there's only one thing grown and have fairly negative impacts on the surrounding environment. And then we're shipping them. And we've also seen impacts on shipping that can be something that you need to overcome. Um, and so at any stage, you've got a lot of vulnerability, but when your food is grown in multiple places close by, and there's a lot of different ways to access them, well, then you have people who know how to grow food and you have it available freshly, and you have community support that makes it available to more people. So I kind of just spoke on that. So how does the local agriculture su support sustainability? Because we might think, okay, well, it's still agriculture, so just because it's local doesn't necessarily mean that it's sustainable. But when you're talking about conventional agriculture, that's typically what we're seeing in the grocery stores, um, conventional agriculture, which are huge industrial-sized farms. Um, and they're also the source of a lot of our concerns with factory farming um, and animal abuse. These are things that come up a lot when you're talking about an industrial scale of agriculture and the negative impacts that come to mind um, when we think about CO2 emissions or if we think about, um, you know, our resources being depleted. We're thinking these giant farms. We're not necessarily thinking about the solutions that we can do when we do things on a smaller scale that's less uh, mechanized and requires less 
um, synthetic inputs like fertilizers and other uh, pesticides and things. So smaller scale gives us a lot of opportunities to get creative with those impacts we were talking about. The impacts are still there. The interactions with the environment are still there, but we're getting um, really creative in how we're doing that. So here's an example of a farm in Ponder, Texas. This is um, one of our farmers, D-Bar Farms. And I'm using this as an example of how we can be more biodiverse because in this picture, you can mainly just see broccoli plants and they're inside of a greenhouse, but they grow for a market. A market garden is completely different than a monoculture because they don't just grow corn. They don't just grow soy. They are growing all types of vegetables that can uh, keep us healthy. You know, broccoli, kale, cauliflowers, uh, definitely lots of delicious tomatoes, strawberries and lettuces. All of these together create more biodiversity because more um, there's more interplay <laughs> that you you don't have to continually spray for pesticides that are going to uh, take over if if you have just corn for example you're going to have to keep spraying um, to make sure that you don't have pests that are going to continually um, interrupt your ability to grow corn but when you have more variety of what you're growing you don't have to use those same management strategies that can be negative on the, in, the environment. You can use um, biodiversity to your advantage. Um, a good example that I think could make a lot of sense for people right now, if you're like, huh, what do you mean? This is kind of um, theoretical sounding, but if you're growing tomatoes and you keep getting, um, you said like, worms <laughs> that it's a horn worm they're like these big green guys uh, on your tomatoes you can you know try to avoid some of these pests by planting things like marigolds um, they don't like the the smell they smell marigolds are a strong smell to a lot of pests and they'll avoid going over there so like that is biodiversity just in the very small nature of having a tomato plant next to a marigold you're already introducing biodiversity that's lessening your need for pesticides. Um, so that's one example of how smaller farms can take approaches that that's not practical on a giant scale, but on a smaller scale, you can do that. Um, okay, and then we have our impact on, uh, on the water. This is a really cool space that I think is fascinating for anyone who's interested in tech and agriculture, because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like programming and things. I just don't even know the language for describing what they have to do for this, but this is aquaponics. Um, this is inside of a greenhouse where they're growing tomatoes aquaponically, which means that they're using water with fish that live inside of the, the water tanks that they have. And then the fish obviously are living and pooping into that water. And that water is being uh, taking down channels where these tomatoes are growing in a greenhouse and that water is sustaining and fertilizing naturally the tomatoes that are growing. Um, so you have to have a lot of knowledge about how to make those systems run effectively. Um, you have to be able to program them to run um, the irrigation at the right timing and um, all that. But this is a very cool way of avoiding having to put any sort of synthetic inputs into the water. It's all coming naturally from the fish. And then also eliminating the possibility of any of that then running off because it's inside of a contained environment. Um, oh, let me see what this question is. I've never heard of turtles being used for aquaponics. Um, I think that would probably have to do with the um, needs of the animal involved in the process. So if you were able to figure out a way to make a tank for fish that was like habitable and enjoyable, you know, for the fish um, or for the turtles, then that could maybe be an option. Aquaponics is typically done with um, tilapia as the fish that they're they're using. I've also seen like koi fish in there too. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool way of mitigating our impacts on water and the potential for runoff. And then regenerative land management. So I told you guys I was going to mention this and it's because it's something that's really exciting to me and I just didn't have 
any prior conception that this was even possible and it's very exciting. Um, in Texas, there are tons of ranches. Um, so much of Texas is covered by ranch land and it's a great advantage to us because what we're seeing is a lot of new techniques in the way that we manage our herds that actually rebuild soils that have been depleted. Um, so this is a picture of Happy Hollow Ranch in Canton, Texas. He, um, they are involved in a lot of different programs with universities right now where they are improving the quality of their ranch simply by managing their herds in a more effective way. Um, the way that cattle has typically been raised in Texas and really across the U.S. is to let uh, your herd stay on a smaller patch of grass until they've kind of depleted it. Um, and then maybe you will um, give them some hay or um, whatever supplemental feed they need once the grass and their choice grasses are gone. Um, and you usually run into some issues because um, the, the soil is going to be depleted over time and you're going to have fewer and fewer of the grasses that they like um, growing in that area because if you have a cow that continually sees like the first sprig of a grass that they really like and then they chew that down it's not really going to have a chance to grow much so you get these depleted soils over time and the biodiversity is completely lacking like think back to the image that i showed you next to the red river where it's very it's very dry um there's not a lot of biodiversity there just a few types of grasses well the thing is is that uh, this prairie landscape, Blackland Prairie and other areas in Texas, were meant for herd animals. So it's actually to our advantage that we have cattle here. Um, buffalo, uh, bison have roamed this area for thousands of years. And so when we look to the knowledge of how do those animals interact with the landscape and how can we mimic that, um, some biomimicry going on here, what people realized is that those herds are closely packed together. They like it. That's their advantage and that's how they feel safer, but they don't stay in one place. Um, they stay tightly packed. They eat down what they like and then they move to another section and then eventually maybe they come back. It's going to be a while. I mean, they've got, you know, they're just meandering, they're herding around, but that land is left and what you get is fertilization of the land that they were on because of their manure. Um, and then an increase in the biodiversity that's there because it's when they chew down um, the grasses just once or twice uh, instead of continually, it actually encourages growth of those plants. So this is really exciting for ranchers who have enough land that they can section off where their cattle are at and then move them to another section and then move them to another section. And so you get to the point where your cattle are on a piece of land maybe once a year and that uh, land is gonna have healthier biodiversity because it's less disturbed. Um, the soil has time to really get roots grown into it from different types of grasses. And they have seen a really amazing results uh, from this. And it's a really cool topic to look into if you have time to just look up regenerative land agriculture um, or regenerative land management. The biodiversity is increasing, the habitat's improving, the health of the animals, very importantly, the health of the animals is improving because they don't require the same amount of antibiotics or um, other things that will keep them healthy when they're in a, a poor environment. When they're living the way that they naturally would, you very rarely um, need to have any sort of antibiotics given to these animals. Um, they're very healthy and they don't run into the same diseases. Um, so this is actually really exciting to see uh, taking off in Texas because not only is it better for the animals, but it's better for the landscape and better for our communities. Um, and then I last for my farms, I wanted to share with you one that I went to go visit this week. So um, Faye's gonna help me out with playing a video here, but this is just showing a small landscape um, how, um, how you can grow on a small scale in a way that produces a lot of food and is still mindful of the environment. Plus you get kind of just a, uh, learn a little bit about what one of our farmers is and what I do when I go visit them. 
Hey, this is Savannah from the Dallas Farmers Market, and today we're on a farm visit to Bootstrap Farm, and this is Philip. Nice to meet you. So Philip's just getting started with his farm out here, and where are we located right now? So we are 15 minutes outside of Sulphur Springs in Brashear, Texas. Yep. And so today you guys have a lot of hands out here to help you kind of get your first garden area going, um, and you're going to be starting to farm with us and be at our market this spring. Yeah. So if you guys are wanting to see exactly how that food is grown and then shop with him this spring when he's here, now's your chance to see exactly what you guys are putting in, all the effort it takes. So what are you guys doing right now? So we're doing a single till method, which essentially is we're tilling once and then never tilling again. Um, so we put some black tarps to kill the grass and realized that it wasn't going to be dead soon enough. Um, so we till the area, put some uh, some leaves inside, some other nutrients, some bone meal. Um, and then essentially what we're doing is we're layering um, cardboard and then compost on top of that cardboard. Yeah, so you've got the, comp the cardboard is here. And then what's the purpose of the cardboard? So essentially what it's going to do is the grass is going to start to grow in the spring. Um, and then when it can't get sun, it just dies back and then it kills uh, the grass. And that cardboard decays, it dies. And then I just have... Uh, the compost on top of that and that's it. Yeah, so you got your guys over here right now shoveling the compost and it's steaming and they're bringing it and lay layering it on top of your cardboard. So these are going to be the beds and what are you planning to uh, plant in your beds? So we're not growing anything that takes longer than 60 days. We're doing a couple things that are going to be longer than 60 days out of the 14 rows, maybe two rows. So it's going to be about 400 feet of plantings. Uh, but everything else is going to be 60 days. So radishes, turnips, um, I'm drawing a blank now, beets, carrots. Uh, so that way we can get a lot of produce over one season. And we're just um, dropping, you know, dropping seed and then pulling out 30, 60 days, flipping the bed, adding some amendments and then planting something new. And that way at the farmer's market, we can just bring a lot of produce consistently. Since we're only on, we're on 10 acres in total, um, but we're only farming this year about a little bit more than one eighth of an acre. So we will have tomatoes, we will have cucumbers, we will have corn and melons, um, but predominantly we'll be bringing a lot of just root vegetables and then uh, I think that's really about it. Root vegetables, I mean, anything, anything you can really think yeah. of. And so as you guys get more comfortable at the market and you expand out here, you're going to add on some more garden beds, but also you guys have some trees. You're going to be planting fruit oh, trees. So yes. that's going to take two year, two to three years. Yeah, so we'll have our blackberries will be ready next year. They'll start producing next year. Uh, our figs will start producing this year a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be nearly enough to bring to the market. I mean, we have about 50 or 60 um, figs, and each one will probably produce two figs this year, but next year is when they really start compounding. Uh, we have mulberries, persimmons, apples, peaches uh, already planted in the ground. Oh, mayhaws, which are really cool. We're doing some really cool Texas natives. Uh, so we'll have mayhaws, which essentially is like a small Texas cherry. Um, the pit's really big. You can use them for jams. So yeah, I don't think you really eat them fresh. Um, and then, oh, also I can talk about the teas. Um, yeah. Something that we're going to be doing that we really want to experiment with is uh, edible flower decays, or flower bouquets. Uh, so one of the ones that we're going to be doing this year will be like a rosemary, um, gofrina flower bouquet that can also double as a tea. So whenever the flower bouquet has like ended its life or like been done and it's done looking pretty, uh, you can hang it up to dry, pull the rosemary off, pull the gofrinas off, and then... It makes a really pretty pink tea from what I've seen. So Awesome. Well, we're excited to have you join us at the market, bring some of those really interesting uh, natural methods of growing to the market and have that like kind of organic option. And also, it's really cool to see all the hands that it takes to bring all this to the market. And we're excited to have you join us. Thank you. It was really exciting to go visit them on their farm. It's really cool to see people um, getting started in a new way. They are brand new farmers. I'm always excited when I see new people trying to take on this challenge because there's a lot of different ways to do it. And when I say that farming is an art, I think they're a really good example of what that means because they're taking their expression of what they feel is really important to bring to the community uh, and they're showing it through what they're growing. And so where do farmers markets come into play? We just saw a few examples. We are a unified voice for small farms and other small business owners. Um, we also are a source of food access and um, we provide education like is going on right now. And then also we are a way for people to have direct sales. Um, so let's kind of break that down a little bit. Um, food access, uh, we accept SNAP, which is 
really exciting for our local farmers because there's not always a way for them to get their food um, to people who really are wanting access to it. And it's also not local food usually available in the grocery stores, which is where most people would typically use um, SNAP EBT benefits. Um, education, I you know, have talked about field trips as well. And um, you know, last year, as a unified voice in a farmer's market, we get the opportunity to just speak on behalf of farmers who are very busy, um, but they still really care passionately about all of these topics. And um, to have the opportunity to even try to be a voice for all of the varying perspectives, um, it's really a challenge, but it's one that I'm excited to, um, to have because it's so important and they all have a message. And the message is that agriculture matters small farms matter um, and what we consume and how we steward our environment is so important. Um, the direct sales are also important. It was worth putting on here. Um, farmers in grocery stores, when you buy produce in the grocery store, typically 14 cents on the dollar goes back to the farmer. Um, that's because they have transportation costs, other overhead, the store being there, the um, employment. When you buy at the farmer's market, every dollar goes to the farmer. So that is huge for them because that means that they can earn a fair living wage. So this is supporting a healthy system, not only for the people who have access to food at the farmer's markets, but it's a healthier system for the people who are growing food. Um, farm workers have notoriously been marginalized and experienced a lot of um, issues in the labor force, and it's definitely still an issue. Um, but when farmers are able to get a fair wage for the food that they're growing, that's a win for everybody. Um, so yeah, farmers markets are a part of a healthy community. Uh, we are a place for healthy food. We are a place where we're encouraging um, a, an improved environmental quality. We are a neighborhood space. Any Saturday or Sunday you come to the farmer's market, it's gonna be lively. Uh, there's gonna be people to talk to and get new ideas from and um, just be encouraged with and learn from. Um, farmer's markets are a pivotal part of a healthy community, but so are the farms uh, that we represent. So in order to protect those farms, uh, we do have to support them. We have to shop with them. Um, so how can you support local agriculture? There are some really small ways that you can do it. You can go all in, but really you can't let perfection be the enemy of progress. So we don't need to only eat with farmers locally every day. For most of us, that's not practical. Um, we enjoy things. We're not trying to deprive ourselves here, but we are taking notice and realizing that there are farmers here every Saturday and Sunday that you can come and support and you can learn from. And if it's not our farmer's markets, there are farmer's markets in your area. There's a directory in Edible Magazine uh, that was published this month with the latest list of farmer mar farmer's markets. And also um, there are some really just great resources to learn what farms are uh, in your area in that magazine and on our website as well. But also I have on here, know your labels. I just feel like that's so important for us to talk about just briefly. Um, when you go to the grocery store and you see something that says fresh, fresh, what does that mean? If it's fresh is on a granola bar, then the concept of fresh has been lost somewhere because that is packaged and uh, shipped to a store and it's probably not whatever we would consider to be fresh. But if we want fresh, that is coming from a local producer because it's coming directly from their farm, often harvested within 24 hours and bringing it to the market. That's a concept of fresh. So when we're looking at our labels and we want to really ask ourselves, what does it mean when we say that something is natural? Like if you see eggs and they say they're natural, well, yes, naturally eggs are natural, I guess. But what does that mean about the methods and how they were raised? Are they free range? Um, the best way to know this information is actually to talk to the person who produced it. And if that's not a possibility, then you can do some research um, if that is something that is important for you when you're buying your groceries. But just to ask the question, what does this mean? Um, and how does that relate to how it was actually grown and the way we interact with the environment? Um, and then knowing your farmer. If you're not coming to the farmer's market, that's okay. But um, it's great to know the farmer. 
uh, how did you grow this food? Does it align with what I think is a great way to interact with the environment? If it does, it can be really uplifting to be a customer of theirs or even be a hand there. And then I also have know your local representatives because there are some really great initiatives going on in Dallas right now to encourage local agriculture and to get a better understanding of what that means for us in our community. Um, so the city of Dallas, adopted the climate action initiative so i just took this from their website if you want to explore their website i would encourage you to do that it's the dallasclimateaction.com but i saw this when i went to their website and i was so excited because yes locally sourced food is more sustainable and does create jobs for dallas sites there are an influx of urban farms growing and um I'm just so excited to see the city taking on this initiative and so when you are aware of what's going on in your local government we can encourage uh, farming locally. Uh, this is a very localized um, concept. It's about knowing your community, um, knowing what's impacting your health, knowing how to make sure your neighbor has access to fresh food. Um, and I just love this quote from Cesar Chavez. He's a big advocate uh, or was um, an advocate in agriculture fighting for farm laborer rights. And it's that the fight is never about grapes or lettuce. It is always about people because at the heart of it, if I care about where my food is coming from, it's because I care about the people who grew it and the health of those who are going to consume it. So that's a really um, powerful message to think, why do we care about sustainable agriculture? Well, it's about the people. Um, so thank you guys for listening to this talk. It was really exciting to speak with you all and share why I think this is such an important topic for us to discuss. And if you have questions, please do email us and um, check out our Instagram, check out our website, get to know the farms that are represented um, through the platform that we have for you guys. Thank you so much, Savannah. That was wonderful. Um, we do have a few questions. We've got a little bit of time, if that's okay. Um, so uh, the first one is, while you were showing the video, um, someone mentioned, that's not how I imagine a farmer. Um, what are the demographics of our farmers? Which I think that's a fabulous question, because we think it's so something so far away um, out of our reach, but they're really just, you know, everyday people so do you from what from what you've seen in your job um like what age range are the farmers that you've that you've worked with yeah that's a great um a great question i know i appreciate that uh, the demographics are available through um a uh, the census that comes through the u.s um well, the U.S. government, I think it may be through the USDA does its own census, but census data is available from within the last five years. I'm trying to remember the most recent, but it shows that things are shifting and mostly with small farms. Um, so most farmers are indeed um, white, white men who are um, an average of, I'm trying to remember, like, 55 plus it may be older than that because it's pretty shocking that most of the farmers in the u.s are aging um, but in small farms that's where we're seeing this difference and that's primarily what we see at our farmers market is um, small farms and so these small farmers by and large have been young adults um, of all different backgrounds um, there's i really can't say that there's a certain um, ethnicity that is more you know involved or represented demographically in this movement it's women it's men it's all people that tend to be younger who are really passionate about these topics we've talked about today about sustainability about caring for their health and caring for the health of others and so if you come to our farmers market and talk to any of the farmers you're going to be shocked at the background of all of them uh, lots of younger people getting involved Thank you. Um, so uh, the next question is, um, can you tell uh, about if there are any real fam family financial benefits to buying eating through these local and diverse options? Um, let's see, I guess I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. Are there financial benefits to eating locally? Is that, do you think that's what? Yeah, that sounds, yeah, that looks like uh, what she means here. Are there any financial benefits to eating locally? 
Well, I think it, yes. I mean, it depends. This is such a broad question. So I guess um, so there's an argument to be made that if you're eating fresh foods, it improves your health and therefore you avoid some of the long-term effects. Um, just because you're eating a diverse diet and you're eating um, healthy foods, you avoid some of maybe the cost of healthcare in the future. That is one reason why local governments are encouraging, um, you know, exercise and eating healthy because it, they recognize that the community health is impacted by that in the long term. Now, I can just speak maybe on a more personal note because I don't have the like statistics here, but on a personal note for eating things that are locally locally grown. Um, I don't can eat exclusively locally grown things, but I do enjoy to add something that is like really in peak season. Like there's nothing to compete with like fresh tomatoes or, um, you know, honey that's locally, um, locally made, raised. I have bees. I don't even know how you call that. Um, <laughs> but when you're adding these things, it can be shifting from other habits because when you're eating food at home, that you're cooking and you really enjoy it, maybe you're not gonna go out to eat because you'd rather eat at home. And so, yeah, you can save money if you're choosing to eat at home because you have these products that you're really excited about and it really feels like a treat um, versus going out to eat. But there are still some financial implications. Um, yeah, local food does tend to be more exp expensive and that is a definite issue. And that's why it's so important for us to have SNAP available and other incentives that make um, farmers that are growing locally able to provide food at a reasonable cost. So right now, that's something that is important to talk about is that the cost tends to be higher than conventional produce at the grocery store, and there need to be some solutions offered. So in some ways, it can be a financially viable option. And then in other ways, yeah, we have some work as a community we need to do to address that. Thank you. Um, so Ebony is asking, um, she may have missed the definition of a small farm. Does it depend on the acreage or how much they have in sales? Yeah, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't define that one. That's a good question because it varies. I've seen some interesting definitions. I was looking at a definition of a small farm um, the other day and it had not only to do with the size of the farm, but also to do with the number of years that the farmer had been growing, which was kind of confusing to me. And so I don't think that there's a standard definition of what qualifies as a small farm. Um, I would say that, you know, you could look at national averages of the size of a farm, but typically if it's a farm that is, you know, family owned and the farmer himself is one of the primary people responsible for the stewardship of that farm that can qualify as a small farm because it's just I guess because of how different it is from um, the industrial agriculture because industrial agriculture is on such a large scale that even a you know even a 5,000 acre farm could be considered small by some standards in if you're in Texas and you're, you know, have cattle. So it varies a lot. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, it would it depend on what you think maybe the involvement of the, the farmer is in the methods that he's using to maintain that farm. Thank you. Um, so we've got, I think we've got time for two more. Um, do you have a veteran presence in your farmer population? Yeah, we do. Um, we have a few different uh, veterans. So on that, I would just want to mention that one of our neighbors over here is a group called FARM. Um, it's uh, Farmers Assisting Returning Military. It's an acronym. And they are actually um, involved in helping um, returning military members just kind of get a hand on farming. Um, so yeah, we do have some veterans and there's also organizations that are working specifically with veterans in the area. Okay, thank you. And lastly, um, we have someone coming from Austin um, and she says they give their compost um, to the city. Um, do you know what the city does with the compost? Um, is there a better um, place to give it to? Like, is there um, a way to give it directly to the farmers? I would 
maybe reach out to some farmers directly. I'm not sure um, if you mean in Austin, if I know exactly what they do with their composting program. I'm not, I'm not familiar. Um, but yeah, and you could ask the city what they do with it. They probably have some sort of program with local farms, hopefully. Um, but if not, you could reach out to some farms directly and just see if they would like to take some of it. I mean, there are local farms at the Dallas Farmers Market who are always, you know, happy to take on some, you know, compost on a reasonable scale. Uh, usually the scale is the issue because once you have more than a few people trying to bring their compost, you can't be certain um, that it's of the quality that you need to make good compost or if it has the things in it that you know, might damage the compost. Thank you so much, Savannah. Um, this was absolutely wonderful. I think you've answered a lot um, of our burning questions about the farmer's market. And I know our district office is right down the road, um, less than um, less than 10 minutes away. And so I know it's um, the Dallas farmer's market is very dear to our hearts. Everybody's very much en enjoyed your presentation. Um, so to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you again, Savannah.